Hey, everyone. Welcome to another episode of Leadership Now with me, Dan Pontifrag. Today in our house, Dr. Neri Kara Silliman. Dr. Silliman, so good to see you. A short bio. Actually, I'd like to go really deep with your bio. It's fantastic. And then we're going to get some great questions about you, your background, your leadership, and uh, interestingly, how leadership and purpose and sustainability play a part in the fashion industry. So, Dr. Silliman, distinguished academic, entrepreneur, and author, known for her expertise in business sustainability and leadership. She got over 20 years of experience in the fashion and luxury sector. Dr. Silliman has established herself as a strategy consultant, a public speaker, an author that specializes in business longevity, resilience, and sustainability. That's the trifecta, I think. She's the founder of a global multi-million dollar sustainability uh, sustainable, sorry, luxury leather goods brand, which manufactures her eponymous label as well as leading Italian luxury brands. She's the author of an award-winning book called Fashion Entrepreneurship, The Creation of the Global Fashion Business. In addition to being a fashion entrepreneur, she's an academic with multiple postings all over the place, and currently as well as an entrepreneur expert at the Sad Business School at University of Oxford. She consults for both emerging and established fashion brands through her consultancy firm, Moda Metier. And her passion lies in understanding the pillars of business longevity and how resilience underpins thriving enterprises and lives. She's guest lectured for places like Apple, Credit Suisse, as well as institutions like the London School of Economics, Royal College of Art, Imperial College of London. She received her PhD from the University of Cambridge and her master's from Sabansi University in Istanbul. Oh my gosh, uh, how good to see you. Uh, it's been a while. Uh, Neri, first I want to get into sort of your journey. Um, maybe people don't know, and so I wanted to spend a, a, some introductory time there from Bulgaria to sure. refugee to how you who you are. So let's let's start there as a child, Bulgaria, and then take us through a little bit of that journey and we'll get into sort of your current state of leadership. Sure. I was born in Bulgaria, um, basically in a ethnically Turkish family. And in the 1980s, the Bulgarian, the communist Bulgarian government decided to carry out an assimilation process against the Turkish ethnic minorities living in Bulgaria. That's how I can explain it. So what that meant is that uh, we were forced to change our names. Our school were converted to these uh, name changing stations and, uh, you know, cars covered in uh, the, these very thick cloth yeah. will come take you and uh, they will show you a very thick book of names that were approved by the communist government and you basically change your name. Um, my name was changed seven times because, uh, yes, because uh, my parents will pick a name that sounded a little bit Turkish and eventually, you know, it will just keep getting rejected. In the end, uh, the this in 1989, the Bulgarian government basically said, now it's time for anyone who feels Turkish to leave the country. But my whole family, even my great grandparents have been born in Bulgaria. So I can't say we even felt Turkish in some ways. You just ethnically Turkish. But um, when we immigrated along with 360, 60,000 Bulgarians of Turkish ethnicity, and we landed at the border with only two suitcases. Oh. The language and the culture is completely different. So it was a, certainly a, a shock to the system. And I was 11 years old at the time. Uh, it was quite a challenging time, quite a jarring moment, I would say. But it was also a moment where I remember this very, very distinctly because we were put in refugee camps uh, at the border that were set up by the Turkish government. Um, and there were so many people all around us. And my father running with the two suitcases, screaming at the border to finally be made it. And I looked around me and I said, if one day I want to have a good life and create a better life for my family, I really, really need to get a good education. 
And this was a very, very clear decision, very clear idea, almost not an idea. It's actually a vision. Mm. And I, I talked about it in one of my talks because I say when you have a very clear vision, it can really pull you forward from whatever situation you may find yourself in. And it doesn't ma- doesn't mean it's going to be easy or that you suddenly everything is just, uh, you know, you make a decision and you suddenly get a good education. I worked very hard for it, uh, despite the odds, because uh, my parents eventually, we had no papers. My eventually, uh, my dad worked as an illegal cab driver, construction worker. My mom is a, a cleaner in a in a medical factory. And I went to school with 83 students in one classroom. Oh my gosh. And we usually didn't have a teacher even come. come. So you you just the, these classes were they were there were no english teacher there was no math teacher you know you were supposed to learn math but there is no teacher but you still go to school <laughs> well you turned into a classroom of autodidacts and i assume you're teaching yourself but okay so i mean you're so young your life has been turned upside down you go from what you knew to being ostracized to a whole other country, Istanbul and the border of Turkey, that for that matter, uh, and I've been is is not Bulgaria. It's not. It, there's very different uh, ways of of operating, I suppose, like a culture. So you you make a pact to yourself. If I want to not live this way, whether it's in refugee camp or just being um, stuck, you make a commitment to yourself about education, and you certainly have. Uh, flourish when it comes to education, multiple degrees, a doctorate, of course. But somewhere along the way, I'm assuming, Neri, that this notion of fashion and entrepreneurship with sustainability and a sense of purpose and meaning and uh, vitality for the planet also intersects. So where did that happen between Bulgaria, Istanbul, and growing up as a teenager in a classroom of 83 people? Very, very good question. I really, really think it has to do with my upbringing. And I actually wrote an article for B Corp uh, because we are B Corp certified. Mm -hmm. Uh, When I am asked this question, I also had to really understand why the business was shaped this way. It has to do, first of all, with being an immigrant. We didn't have many resources when we were starting the business. It wasn't We didn't have any capital, but I did work as a translator from the age of 16. And I was taking the Turkish leather manufacturers from Istanbul to Italy. My father was actually selling uh, their leather wallets and making commission out of them. My job was to be the translator. This way, I really understood how, uh, how the industry works. From a practical standpoint, it wasn't just seeing a bag at a shopping window. It was really understanding that you have to buy the leather. You have suppliers. Who are these suppliers? How things are made? And really seeing the craftsmanship, the effort that goes into making something. This was very important. Growing up in Bulgaria, my grandfather also would always tell us, and we were growing up in a very poor family, it's communism, you are ethnic minority, you don't have the resources that are available to other families necessarily. So self-sustainability, being self-sustaining was a very important factor growing up. So we grew up everything ourselves, our fruits, vegetables, uh, you know, even our chickens, everything was in nature and you were, you respected nature. And that comes really from my childhood, almost lack of resources make you really appreciate mm. and understand and value everything. So when it was time to start the business, I had the idea at University of Miami during one of my courses, which was to write a business plan. And I thought, okay, 
uh, I'm going to, let's imagine that we are going to start a business. How will I make it possible? How will that be? Um, and going to the Italian suppliers, asking them for the leather that they are discarding, <laughs> for the leather that they are not using, leather offcuts. At the time, nobody was doing this. And it was just simply because we didn't have capital, we didn't have resources. And this idea of respecting nature, this comes from my childhood, really, mm. and from my background. I didn't learn it at the university, really. At the time, sustainability wasn't really this concept that people talked about. If uh, even, I don't know, even 20 years ago, if someone said, I have a sustainable brand, you think, you know, they are doing something as a hobby. It's not really multi-level or a very high-growing brand. So... We went to our suppliers and relationships that you build with your suppliers, your employees are very much part of sustainability for me as well. Because often when we talk about sustainability, the very first thing that comes to mind is the raw material that you use hmm. or how a product is made. But I think it's quite often overlooked. The way you treat your employees, how you are, in your work environment with your employees and the suppliers, the relationships that you build with your suppliers, just thinking we are all part of this ecosystem. Mm. We are all in this together. It's not just, it's not about my business and you know what I can get out of it, but it's about all of us building something together. So this is to me very much sustainability as well. Yeah, you've you've cracked the code on moving from me to we, from being uh, selfish to selfless, and some might coin it as part of a circular economy. Of course, what what you've done very well, I think, is your five step plan for sustainability as well. And uh, for folks that may not know this, uh, let me I'll just sort of introduce it, and then I, I'd like you to elaborate on it because I think it's quite powerful, and it's almost a it's kind of like a bit of a model that could be used in different industries, quite frankly. So your uh, the kind of the five step plan is really about achieving this business sustainability, and it's 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 a model to me that takes into account human beings, uh, our need to be in relationships, to be collaborative, to be circular, of course. So if I'm simplifying these, uh, my apologies, but I want I want to start and then you take over. So you want to communicate a powerful vision, which is this sort of um, I guess commitment to sustainability. You want to embrace um, strong regulations for sustainability. So moving away from compliance to kind of basically saying this is part of our business, like innovatively. Prioritize um, quality and durability. So this notion of resource usage is kind of what you're getting at, right? How do you repurpose? Uh, four is integrating sustainability into your core strategy. So how business goals can be aligned and, and systemically integrated with um, your sustainability practices. And then this notion of, long, like, I guess this is you, right? Li lifelong learning, innovation, curiosity, and, and staying ahead because sustainability isn't resting on the laurels of yesterday. It's like, what can we do differently to improve? So that sort of five-step model, I think, is really cool. Um, tell me a bit why you felt compelled to to come up with that. And and again, then maybe help us understand its importance for for these organizations you get to work with. Well, I am often asked by startups I uh, consult, by companies I work with, and you mentioned uh, I work as an entrepreneurship expert at University of Oxford. Even there, they will always, almost quite often, ask me, how do I balance sustainability with profitability? How do I start a business that is sustainable? Almost like... You know, it's. I still, I, I'm, I'm still. Even yesterday, got asked the same question. So hmm. I wanted to just distill it and say, here is how it's possible, and sustainability and business longevity, profitability, can only go hand in hand. You know, and then I think if you sustainability, as I said, it's not just about the raw material that you use. It's about the entire business again the quality of your products, 
the suppliers you work with. When it comes to innovation, I think, again, that point, sometimes you can think, I don't know if I have, what is innovation? It might, it, for small and medium enterprises, this can sound daunting for startups, especially, or a student who is working on a venture. But even just combining your designers with many teaming teaming up your designers with manufacturers can lead to some ideas that you don't necessarily think of, uh, which is what happened in our own company, for example. So just thinking of the entire system all together mm. and realizing it all comes together. So that's how I developed the five step step framework. I had to ask myself, how is it that we have done it? and just summarizing it into a system. In uh, sounds self-serving in this case, but in one of my books called The Purpose Effect, I came up similarly with a five-step model called The Good Deeds. And the deeds stand for delight your customer, so kind of go above and beyond, engage your employees so they know that you mean business in the world of good, uh, ethical decision. So every decision runs through a practice of which, well, what are we doing for our community, the environment, our people, uh, humanity? Uh, the second D, sorry, of deeds is deliver fair practices. So don't consume more or take more than you can. What is circular? What can you repurpose? What can you reuse? And then uh, serve all stakeholders, not just shareholders. And so what I'm hearing from what I'm hearing from you though is that you you're saying okay any any it's not just fashion <laughs> any organization yeah. any industry can really be thinking through how to be uh how to use the kind of five steps because there there's sustainability needs in any industry in any way in which we're an entrepreneur so uh if you agree with that I'm assuming you do how do you help leaders see the light uh in the which in your work I think just moving, there are two things. One is, you know, short-term thinking versus long-term thinking. And another one is slow. how, how much growth do you want and how fast? Uh, I think these two principles, the, not princi these two factors will trip up what I've seen in my research and in the practical life, trip up the leaders because they need to deliver growth they need to, at the end of the year, say, okay, this is uh, the profit that we were able to achieve. These are the markets that we have expanded into. <clears throat> but I think, excuse me, but I think you really need to understand that often the very fast growth can actually eventually really put a hurdle on the company. And also if you, if you have this idea, okay, I'm going to create a business that is going to uh, deliver a very high profit right now, but without thinking of the long-term effects. So we see in fashion quite often today, it's quite a problematic industry. We have Sheen, which is this fast fashion brand. Um, and my students ask me, <clears throat> sorry, I'll just get some water. Mm. Also journalists as well. They interviewed me for this company and they said, but they are making so much money and there's a lot of people buying from them. And I said, yes, right now, but I really don't think in 10, 15, this is impossible for the company to continue unless they change something very, very drastically. Mm. So I think because you mentioned my research looks at business longevity from what I see in the literature, the companies that have stood the test of time, they don't, they never, none of them think short term. And most of the time they are driven by community engagement, giving back, nurturing the environment. Um, and I th think this is basically the answer. The two really key aspects of that I, I'd like to tease out a little bit uh, is the propensity or proclivity of senior leaders, if not the board of these companies, um, being stuck in a mindset that is, as you say, short term. So short termism being we need to operate for the quarter 
you know, on a fiscal year, what have you done yep. for me lately? We need to make EBITDA or revenue or profitability for the quarter. And so it's panic, it's insanity. The culture gets sucked into this vortex of inanity because everyone is trying to find some sort of short-term revenue to hit, quote, the target. So it's anti-long-term. It's very much short-termism. Um, but the second one there is sort of the fixation on growth and yes. how much growth is actually enough in this day and age, which then allows people to say, well, we'll throw that out because we, we, we don't care. We're just thinking about growth. And so this whole mindset becomes very negative. And then the consequences, of course, are the earth, uh, people's anxiety and health and their stress and so on. So yeah. how, how do you rationalize this for us, Mary? Please help me. <laughs> you summarized it very well. I think rationalizing i i am quite hopeful in the sense that i feel a lot of we are having these conversations now as a society i am hopeful that the mindset is shifting so in the end it's about your stakeholders to also really understand your shareholder stakeholders to understand you can keep growing at the rate that you used to grow that's just not sustainable and there has to be other factors that come into play, not just growth and profitability. Um, and to really show here as researchers and also as practitioners, thought leaders, it's our job to show and back it with research. What we are saying can be backed with research. So there's some really good examples out there. Um, you know, there's some terrible ones. What's, what's one that comes to mind for you, either that you've been able to work with directly or that there's an organization or a crew of senior leaders that sort of saw the light and they they made a change in the way in which that ultimately they needed to operate their organization. Gosh, very good question. Patagonia is a, is an example that everyone uses, but there are some other brands in fashion. I will give you the examples. Another Tomorrow, which is a degrowth brand. What I just talked about, they are... Um, not focusing on growing at a very, very high rate. They are, I also, there are no, non-profit firms like Remake, for example. Um, they are saying, they are advocating for not buying. Uh, they are saying, don't, don't keep consuming. Don't keep buying new products. And this anti, anti-growth or not anti-growth, but degrowth, principles uh, that we are seeing, I would say, are quite encouraging. I agree. So I'll give you a, a personal example. So I buy most, maybe not all, but most 90% of my hats and my shoes from two uh, ethical, sustainable organizations. My shoes come from a company in Vancouver called John Fluvog Shoes, Fluvogs. Uh, and my hats come from a millinery in Toronto uh, called Lilliput Hats, a sort of 30-year-old millinery company. Karen Ruiz, who runs the Lilliput Hats, has this incredible um, eye for going to like um, like shows, like one-of-a-kind shows and, and people who are in the circular economy. And so she's grabbing little trinkets from like a hundred years ago. She's going into garage sales and sort of like, you know, these um, antique shops and she's repurposing materials and repurposing trinkets, et cetera, for hats. So I've got hats where she's put in, you know, little keyboards or typewriters that are little trinkets that go on my hat, repurposing ribbons from, you know, 50 years ago, 60 years ago. So I'm curious then, what do we need to, whether it's fast fashion or whether it's luxury fashion or just the fashion industry, how do you, what, what are you doing, I guess, right, to help some of these leaders see, well, there's a different way of operating, you know, this particular uh, industry as a fashion entrepreneur. Just uh, with my articles, by talking, <laughs> for yeah. example, being on your podcast, <laughs> uh, but also, but also just the success of the company, I think th this is, it speaks for itself, showing how it can be done and that it is possible for it to be done. But as I mentioned, the, the question here, 
how much growth do you want and how fast do you want to grow and how much how profitable do you want to be because my company is successful i will call it that uh, at the same time i am not hermes i obviously i am a still a small and medium sized family run business we produce for very high end italian brands prada and miu miu are two of them uh, but at the same time as i said i am not prada i am not louis vuitton or hermes because i choose not not just choose i am relatively quite young firm 25 years in the business right uh, and what worked for us and the way that we see it the right way is to not introduce new styles every six months or every three months we have kept the same classic styles sometimes we will change the leather but not often um, we don't have this marketing where we encourage you to keep buying a new bag a new wallet um, we often will receive messages from clients that say i've used the same belt or the same wallet for 15 years in fact that reminds me i gave a, a gift to the president of university of miami i was doing a speech there when he uh, came to the university first. And how many years later, 10 years later, we met in London last year and he was still wearing the <laughs> same belt. Uh, that, must, that must make you smile. <laughs> yes. So just, to, I think, how do you make the change by being an example? Mm. You... In your DNA, of course, is uh, is what I think is a very important characteristic and a trait, and that is resilience. Like you are one resilient individual, and it seems as though that you you can't. Well, maybe you can, but you'll tell me. But to be sustainable and to shift to becoming more ethical in the way in which you operate a business as a senior leader, as an entrepreneur, somewhere along the way, you have to. There are things you have to overcome. There are things that you know that are going to uh, hit you, and you're like, mm -hmm. oh, gosh, you have to persevere. So how do you rationalize sort of the need to be resilient and know that it's not smooth when you're making a shift to being a more purpose-driven, sustainable, socially responsible business um, practice and operations? I think in today's day and age, everyone everyone is hit with challenges. I think especially when you are trying to, um, I don't want to call be a pioneer in sustainability. I don't see our company as that, but when you are trying to make it against odds with very limited resources, still be family run, we never raise any outside investment. Of course, you, you just face different challenges, but I think, when it comes to resilience, every every business in in today's day and age has to has to be. Uh, but I've written quite a lot of articles on this topic about resilience, just psychological resilience and business resilience as well. And I think the findings of my research were quite surprising because I thought when I ventured out to learn about resilience and research it i thought it will be about uh, flexibility it will be about um, strength but what i found out was very different um, it's it's not it's not about strength in, in in fact it's about saying i don't know how to do this uh -huh. or acknowledging that now it's a very challenging time um, and it's never once you have been resilient doesn't mean that you will continue to be it's you keep building it's a muscle you keep building and it's not about saying i am the best the strongest company uh, but recognizing recognizing even it works on a personal level too recognizing your weaknesses well, I actually have a couple more questions that I want to I want to dig a little bit deeper into this. Your your life, your work, uh, both when you integrate the two, seems to be one of renewal. You you keep 
um, coming up against these roadblocks, these obstacles, whether you're 11, whether you're in a class of 83, uh, whether you're realizing you need uh, uh, an undergrad, a master's, a PhD, you, you seem to keep coming up against something. And then there's you've learned a strategy that, well, there's a roadblock here in the way I need to find a way to get over the roadblock. So how would you characterize, I suppose, right, the, the skill and the muscle nary that you have developed so others can learn from the way in which that you continuously renew yourself? Dan, this is something nobody ever told me. It's the first time I'm, I'm hearing it and it's, well, thank you. It's quite accurate in some ways. If I look back, uh, I kept, uh, you know, Doric calls it reinventing, reinventing yourself, but it's very much renewal. Um, I think I have a very, you know, I said it in the article as well, and earlier in our conversation, I have a very clear vision of what I would like to achieve. And it doesn't mean, but I also have flexibility. It, it's very hard to describe it. I have a vision. Let's say I know I want to get to Paris, but on the way to Paris, suddenly uh, I may encounter a traffic accident. There may be divergence, you know, just the road is blocked. Um, I tend to accept that. I just accept whatever is happening and don't fight against it. And if the road leads me this way, I still have keep the vision in my mind. I still know where I want to get to or the feeling that I want to, I want, I will, I think I will get when I get to my destination. But I do welcome those roadblocks or challenges and just work around them or work with them, but not against them. I think that's how I can describe it. But nobody asked me this before. So even now giving you the answer, I had to think about it. But uh, that would be it, accepting what is. Well, it's very profound. Accepting what is, uh, not working against the challenges, but finding the wherewithal and the sort of added of muscular brain power that you need to develop in order to persevere. Uh, and not go backwards. I think that's what I'm learning from you. And you know, I'm just, I really think if you also something I had to learn as well to let go, to surrender, uh, and to always know there is a bigger power, bigger energy, higher guidance, whatever you want to call it, guiding us, guiding our lives. And yes, I may have this vision where I want to get to. Um, and if there is a diversion, I will follow that. So I love it. Okay. It reminds me quickly, uh, when I was 18, I graduated at, uh, as a valedictorian in my high school. Nobody in my family has been to university. And it was, of course, I have to get this good education and the possibility, the vision I had was to get into Turkish university. That's what's available. I want to get to the best university in my country. Uh, everyone thought this is 100% going to happen because I have all A's. I'm very good at, you know, at the tests and everything. To my big surprise, I failed the Turkish university entrance exam. Wow. And that's a huge roadblock. And, uh, you know, that means I have to go to work. So I accepted, even though it was difficult, I accepted. But also I started to look for alternatives. And that alternative led me to get financial aid that brought me to University of Miami. Always looking for a way to continue the vision, although there might be a diversion yes. to get there. 
Yes. It's very powerful. So too, as well, my final question, I wanted to to sort of uh, tangentially ask you about your sustainability vision, your sustainability practice, the way in which that you're bringing social purpose, if I might call it that, to your yeah. your practices, the way in which that your business operates um, ethically, sustainably, et cetera. You also are committed to diversity and inclusion, which to me is actually a sustainability practice. And so yes. whether you are uh, hiring women of disadvantaged backgrounds, whether you're thinking about the age of uh, the women or the men that you're in or the employee, you, you actually, to me, that's a social purpose, sustainability practice, thinking about who uh, makes up these organizations. So could you tell me a bit about your sort of leadership thinking yeah. when it comes to DNI? You are spot on. In fact, you know, Take everything away. This is the most, the thing I am most proud of that we were able to achieve is hiring people who are no longer in the workforce. This, these are women in Bulgaria. So we have two operations. One is a factory in Istanbul and another one in Bulgaria. In Bulgaria, I was able to work with the EU, with the EU and the Bulgarian government um, to ensure and to put together a system that will allow us to hire women from who are no longer able to get back into the workforce. They are women over the age of 60, 65. And mm. unfortunately, the economy in Bulgaria, it's uh, quite weak. Uh, they are unable, but they really want to work. So, and young men and women also from disadvantaged backgrounds who didn't have access to education, they want to work, but they are not able. The 90%, 90, over 90% of people I employ, we employ in Bulgaria are women from such backgrounds. And, and it was it was quite interesting because they all live in same or similar areas. This also, when I was filling in the sustainability certifications docu documents, in terms of travel, it also uh, it's, <laughs> it reduces travel time. But that's uh, another for another detail. In Turkey, we employ immigrants and refugees, uh, particularly from Albania, from Syria, from. Um, eastern part of Turkey, who also have a lot of difficulty finding work in Turkey. Um, I think this comes from the fact that I know what it feels like to be discriminated against. Mm. And uh, I know how much it can hurt, how much it can be a block. And if someone comes and says, uh, you know what? You can do it. There is a chance. If some if someone can be that light, you know that you are going to grab it with both hands. And that's what I hope to do. Um, and I was very honored when we went through the sustainability certification with B Corp and Positive Luxury. It's an independent. These are these two companies don't talk to each other. Um they nominated us and they classified us as social innovators. I, I was very happy about that. To me, it's like better than profitability. It's better than, uh, you know, seeing your name on a, on a bag or on a company. It's, it's just the most fulfilling part. That's so gorgeous. Uh, and whether it's the people in Sofia or any of the other cities in Bulgaria and other countries that you're helping, you're doing a fantastic ethical purpose first uh, leadership style that I think um, many, many individuals and leaders need to look up to. Uh, it's quite a joy to listen in and um, understand more from what makes you tick, but the the impact the positive social impact that you're making in this world of ours. Um, Dr. Neri, Kara Silliman, where can we find out more about you and your work? Um, I am, you can follow me on LinkedIn, <laughs> Neri Kara Silliman. Uh, I am also on Instagram. I, uh, it's 
prof.neri and uh, our company page is Neri Kara uh, and my consultancy firm is Moda Metier. We'll make sure that gets all into the show notes for folks that um, uh, want to follow you and find out more about uh, what you're up to. It's been such a, a just a delight to get to know you a little better and to understand more about how your brain and your heart most importantly works. Uh, two very important traits of you, Dr. Silliman, is clearly thinking about where the intellectual side of empathy comes from. So you're thinking about what people are thinking and going through, but you're using your heart as well, equally so to help people feel uh, a better life. And for that, I think all of us thank you. Uh, thank you. Thank you. It was just uh, such a pleasure to talk to you. And uh, you were able to pinpoint things I didn't even realize myself. So thank you. Well, my kids don't like it when I do it. But uh, when it's uh, <laughs> when it's someone who's much smarter than me, I'm very happy to. Folks, you've, uh, you've been listening to another episode or watching of Leadership Now with me, Dan Pontifrac, in the house today. Uh, the incredible Dr. Neri Kara Silliman. Uh, author, entrepreneur, academic, all things above. Most importantly, what a great human being. We'll catch you next time on another episode. Thanks, Neri.